It's a blowout. Eighth inning, 10-3. Bases are loaded for Verlander, who waits out a real pitch. He swings, and it's a high fly ball. Deep center field. It is gone. Home run. And a huge bat flip to celebrate. All right, Ben, start the show already. What is up, everybody? Welcome into this Friday episode of Flippin' Bats. This one is going to be a lot of fun. What better way to head into the weekend than hearing from pitching legend John Smoltz, Hall of Famer. But it's not just one guest for you today. It's two. We have one of the greatest pitchers of all time, John Smoltz, and one of the best follows on pitching Twitter, Rob, a.k.a. Pitching Ninja, is joining me as well. So we get a double whammy here on this Friday, and both of them are absolutely great. John Smoltz, a legend, asking him three questions. He's been joining me most every week lately, which has just been so much fun for me. The stories he tells are always great. So uh, I'm pumped to get to him. And let's start with John Smoltz first. So let's welcome in now the Hall of Famer for the Atlanta Braves, John Smoltz. All right, and I am pumped to be joined again by Hall of Famer John Smoltz. John, thank you for joining me, my friend. This is always fun. Yeah, it's a fun part of my week. I look forward to it every uh, every time we get a chance. That's awesome. Me as well, my friend. Me as well. Let's start with Aaron Judge this week. Aaron Judge is doing things that we haven't seen in a long, long time. When you see what Judge is doing, what comes to mind for you? You've faced the Bonzes of the world, the Sammy Sosa, when they were in the midst of their home run streaks. What does what Aaron Judge is doing remind you of? You know, it really doesn't remind me of anything because I can't remember the separation uh, between the home run leader and the next guy. So he really has <clears throat> dwarfed the, uh, the stadiums, if you will, and separated himself in a way that I don't know statistically when's the last time there's been 20 plus home run difference between the leader and the second place and really the rest of the league. So I think for Aaron judge, he's proven that he's healthy. I think the Yankees have done a better job of not giving him so many off days just because, right. I think sometimes in baseball, when you have this preset scenario where you're going to give guys the ability to get off their feet, what if they're hot? What if they're going through a great stretch and the fact that they've been better with him meaning he's playing a lot, he's in a good place, he's staying healthy, he's in a groove. Don't take a guy out of the lineup unless he's injured. Yeah. And I think he really separated himself from the rest of the league. And I think you can make the argument now, he's really put himself in the really, I think, a heavy favorite for the MVP. Does he personally remind you of anybody back from, from the era of which you played? I think he's a combination of Albert Pujols and Dave Winfield. We don't see too many six foot eight players. And I think Dave Winfield and his <laughs> size is what I would I'd, I'd morph it with uh, Albert Pujols. When, when Aaron Judge has eliminated the windows of opportunity for pitchers to get him out, that is put him in an elite category. Before there was too many places you could get him out. And now he's eliminated. Maybe there's one, only one place you could get him out that down and away when he's got a reach at six foot eight. You know, he's a byproduct now of a lot of hard work, I'm sure, and dedication to recognizing pitches and staying off the ones he cannot hit. On the pitching side of things, John, I feel like we haven't been talking about this enough and it just slid under the radar. Spencer Strider, the fastest pitcher in history to 200 strikeouts in a season, topping Randy Johnson's record. Unbelievable there. So along those same lines, how how has he done this? And does Spencer Strider remind you of anybody from when you played? Yeah, first and foremost, I give him a lot of credit for what he's been able to do. Come back from Tommy John. He hasn't had any history of innings pitched, and they're not really talking about it, which I think is the mental side, which is great. And he's in an era where it's easier to strike out guys philosophically because of the style of hitting. But you still got to go do it. You still have to throw the pitches that he throws. Right. He has a unique release point. They can't pick up the fastball. He's got great force spin, force spin on that fastball, which makes the perception to the hitter that it's actually harder than it is. And I think, again, a guy that is staying healthy, he knows his body, he does exercise, tremendous lower half. And he's kind of a little bit, not, not – the same as a Tom Seaver drop and drive, but he's got that Nolan Ryan lower half, and he's really figured out how to uh, deliver the pitch 
with the maximum effort without exhausting his upper body. He's using his whole body to, to kind of wear the stress, if you will, as the ball comes off the fingertips. So he's very unique. He's got that side straddle kind of delivery. But uh, I just like the approach the Braves have taken and just the approach he's taken. Really a two-pitch pitcher. So, you know, when he develops yeah. a third pitch, who knows what he's capable of doing. And I just like the fact that he is not bothered or no one's talked about the innings load that he's had on his uh, young career. Yeah, I love that as well. So does Strider, when you watch Strider pitch, does, does he remind you of anybody? Well, you know, I, I think um, – I think it's it, it's hard to, to say that his mechanics are similar to Tom Seaver. They're not. But when I think of, a, of a, a smaller drive guy, I think it's closer to Tom Seaver when he gets that extension off the mound. He's one of the highest extension, meaning the release points close to seven feet. And he's not that big, right? Randy Johnson's six foot 10 and his release point would be uh, a little bit longer just by his height. But as a smaller guy, he gets downhill and he gets the ball to home plate about as good as anybody. So, you know, his mechanics are unique and they're, 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 they're unique to him. And, and I think that's what makes it difficult to have a true comp. When you would have said in, in April that the Braves are going to be knocking on the door of 100 wins and one of the best teams in the National League, and a big reason for that is going to be Spencer Strider, people would have probably said, what are you talking about? But I do feel like the Braves are in a position where they are right now, and a big part is because of what he has done. They were not playing great until he and Michael Harris got called up. So I think what Spencer Strider has done this year not only is worthy of a Rookie of the Year award, but I think he's a big reason they're here right now. There's no doubt about that. I mean, when you talk about the Charlie Morton coming back from injury, started off slow, the Braves started off slow, and they were really behind the eight ball, 11 games back. It's been their pitching that they can match up with everybody. They have the perfect scenario moving forward. Now, the only thing I would be concerned about, and I, I'm going to break my own little uh, kind of like glad no one's talking about the innings, is if they don't win the division, <laughs> how they handle their staff moving forward in trying to win four playoff series to get to the World Series and win it all. So that'll be a unique strategy that I'm sure Brian Snicker will have ready to go if and when they are in that position. John, I know you have – a lot of great stories um, from your days playing baseball, obviously, but you're also a great golfer you've golfed with and you know, Tiger Woods well, but what I want to ask you about is a time years ago, you actually pitched to Tiger Woods threw him some BP. How did, how did this process go down? What is the story of you pitching to Tiger Woods? Yeah. So we were playing a bunch of round of golfs and he mentioned about trying to bat against me one day. And I was like, man, I don't know about that. I, I, it's not that I'm worried about hitting you. I'm worried <laughs> about you jamming, you know, your thumbs and golf. That would be, that would be bad. And I said, actually, you know, I'm pitching a simulation game, a sim game in the stadium. There won't be anybody there. Teams on the road, you could suit up and you could be one of the hitters. And he was, I'm all in. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, I'm all in. So he showed up, he took batting practice, put on the Braves uniform and he stood in there for about four or five at bats. And he told me, and this is the competitor in Tiger Woods. He goes, do not lay off of any pitch. I want to see everything you've got in game speed and game ready. And I went, all right. I mean, you know, the equivalent would be me trying to win the Masters in my first ever start. It's never going to happen. And, and the ability of his athleticism and his grit and determination, just people don't understand how hard it is to hit a baseball. Just like people don't understand how hard it is to hit a golf ball perfectly straight under the pressure of what these guys do. So he went up there and after the first couple of bats, I knew it was going to be a little bit of a struggle. And then about the fourth at bat, I tried putting one, uh, one, you know, laying it in there. He hit a ground ball up the middle that he declared a hit. Uh, and he, so he declared himself <laughs> one for four with a walk and a hit. And he, and he found that, you know, he asked me later if I was laying a couple in there. And I said, yeah, he got mad at me. He's like, I told you I didn't want that to happen. But it was a fun deal. Um, it'll be a memory of a lifetime. Of course, he's got, you know, all decked up in the Braves uniform and that was the time of, uh, of our lives there, being able to do something that I was preparing to do. And it gave him a perspective of being in the batter's box, seeing a 90 mile an hour slider and a 94 mile an hour fastball, because I was at, you know, trying to get ready for the season. 
So there's a lot of baseball players that like to play golf. And, you know, the, it translates okay. Like, there's a lot of baseball players that can be good golfers. And then you look at players from other sports trying to play baseball or trying to golf. It's not always great. But you don't often see golfers step in the box where you can really see their swing. So Tiger Woods, the greatest, one of the two greatest golfers of all time. What's his baseball swing actually like? It was pretty good. It really was. You know, uh, when you think about, uh, I, I am some some golf teachers uh, teach a baseball swing and a golf swing at a different plane. If you think about swinging the bat through the zone and the way that guys are trying to hit today, it's similar to hitting a golf ball that's not moving. And you have to have your timing right, and you have to have the ability to deliver that club at the same time you would deliver a bat. Now, that is what I believe is is a golf swing at a different plane, and you can get in some bad habits that cross over, and that's why a lot of managers won't let position players play in season. But I just think it's more to do about the athleticism of Tiger, whether it's shooting a basketball or it's playing ping pong. His hand-eye coordination is really good. And if there was ever a competition between golfers putting a ball in play off of big leaguer, I would choose him uh, over uh, most because of his ability just to time and, and, and be athletic. And that's what he is. He's one of the most athletic golfers of all time. That's awesome. Uh, on the golf course, any stories with Tiger that come to mind that, that are able to be told on here? Yeah, we, we had so many great memories and so many great times where, you know, I've told people, anyone that came with me, don't rile him up because he's kind of going through the motions. Don't get him in that uh, tournament mode. Don't, don't try to challenge Tiger Woods. <laughs> there was one particular uh, round that we had. We had a fivesome. I had a buddy of mine who flew me down to play with Tiger, another buddy of mine. So the total, you know, uh, my one buddy was 11. The other was a scratch and we had three scratch and, and, and a, a tiger and tiger and an 11 a handicap. And on a par three, the scorecard read five, four, three, two, one. So we had all five scores, different scores and a hole in one by my buddy who Scott, you know, made a hole in one with Tiger Woods. And I picked the ball out of the hole. And I said, you know, what's more believable, Scott, when we get back home, the fact that you made a hole in one or beat tiger by four on one hole. Believe it or not, <laughs> Tiger got the five on a par three. I got a four, and then the other two got a three, two, and a one. Well, he proceeded to give me a signal with his finger, and he let me know that it was on. And he went 12 under in the next 21 holes. And that's the kind of player that Tiger Woods is. When you motivate him in any way or shape or for fashion, he goes to the next level. It was the most unbelievable round of golf I've ever seen after I made that, you know, comment about beating him by four <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible speaking of hole in ones with with tiger woods my brother doesn't have one and he's a great golfer and he doesn't have a hole in one yet but he's playing with tiger woods about two years ago and they're at i believe it was at mj's course and they're out there and justin hits this ball and it was during the height of COVID. justin hits a ball it's kind of a lower green you can't quite see everything perfectly but it's him and Tiger, and you see the ball land, it comes back, and it disappears. So Justin and Justin and Tiger Woods are celebrating his first ever hole-in-one on the tee box together. Tiger chucked his club. They were having a blast. They walked down there, and it hit. It was sitting like half an inch outside of the hole. And oh. Justin and Tiger both believed that it hit the foam, I think, was still in the cup. So they believed yeah. that it hit the foam and bounced out. But Justin's like, I can't count it. I, I just can't count it. But that would have just been the coolest thing of all time. Yeah. Um, John, no thank you. Thank you so much for joining me, my friend. Always a lot of fun. The stories are always great. The baseball knowledge obviously is great. But this is fun, man. Thank you so much for joining me again. All right. Look forward to next week. All right. Just wanted to thank again, John Smoltz for joining me. Those conversations are always so fun. And I hope you all appreciate having a legend on flipping bats every single week. And where else are you hearing stories about Tiger Woods taking batting practice? To me, that was my favorite. And I would have loved to been a fly on the wall or on the outfield grass, whatever you want to call it. When John Smoltz was pitching to Tiger Woods, really cool story there. So thanks again to John Smoltz for joining me, but this episode is not done yet. Every week, Pitching Ninja joins me as well to discuss his top five nastiest pitches of the week, and we're going to do that right now, plus a few bonuses that are pretty funny as well. So thank you to John Smoltz, and now let's get 
to Rob, a.k.a. Pitching Ninja. All right, I am pumped to be joined by my good friend Rob, a.k.a. Pitching Ninja, for this week's nastiest pitches of the week, plus some extra fun stuff, which we'll get to as well. But, Rob, first off, welcome back in, my friend. Always a pleasure. Always. It is always a pleasure being here, too. I'm pumped as well. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, indeed. So let's start uh, first on your list this week. Nastiest pitches of the week. You have Sandy Alcantara. Let's talk about him a little. Yeah, I've, I've definitely got to give it to him. I mean, the man has been amazing all season. Had another complete game this week. And this just symbolizes his filthiness. I mean, this 100-mile-an-hour sinker is absolutely disgusting. Look at that break. All you can do is watch it. I don't under, I don't understand a hundred mile an hour sinkers. I used to, so when I was when I was playing, everybody in in minor league baseball had velo still. So like you'd see a hundred come out of the pen, and then I, I was fine with a hundred, fairly straight, fine with that. Velocity wasn't the big deal. But when you started seeing ninety four, ninety five with sink. I was like, I mean, what are you supposed to do with this? Now we're seeing a hundred with sink, and I really don't understand how anybody is supposed to ever hit it. It just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you said that because you still get people on social media, whatever, going, why'd he swing at that or why'd he take that pitch? That pitch moved 19 inches arm side with sink. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, Sandy Alcantara is, uh, I assume he's been on your list a good bit this year. Some of the stuff he throws is just, is just disgusting. So, uh, once again, Sandy Alcantara back on the list. Absolutely. And he has been on there a, a, a good bit. Um, you know, I don't think he gets the credit for being as filthy as he is. Everybody sees him as workhorse throwing 94 mile an hour change ups you know, sliders that move the wrong way. Sometimes he, he is, he's a filth machine as well as a workhorse and deserves yeah. every award he gets. It, it's refreshing seeing workhorses in today's day and age. Cause you see a lot of guys throwing six innings and getting out of there. Sandy's been uh, throwing more complete games than we have seen in a long time, which is refreshing. Um, so, next up on your list, Luis Castillo. Yeah. Another two seamer again. I mean, I guess I'm, sense in a theme here but this one is also wicked and you get the hitter reaction there i mean when you get the guy ducking out of the way of a 97 mile an hour front door two seamer that's that's perfection it may have been a tiny the, bit uh, off the plate the fist pump he's so much fun to watch like he's always been one of my favorite guys because he pitches with emotion He's done a uh, a moonwalk off the mound after a K. Like he's the man. I love watching him pitch. Pure electricity. <laughs> I like him as well. And and that rotation, by the way, is going to be a problem for somebody in the playoffs. You throw out Luis Castillo, Robbie Ray, Logan Gilbert. Um, they're a legit contender when it comes October, in my opinion. George Kirby too. Like George Kirby is like the new Greg Maddox. Greg Maddox 2.0. I mean, dude. Other than today, he doesn't walk a lot of people. And he, I mean, he's got that little two seamer, got great command. I mean, amazing yep. command. Um, so yeah, they're gonna yep. be they're legit Nasty. and a legit bullpen. Yeah. Nastiness. Um, let's just hope Julio Rodriguez is okay because I saw again he was taken out. So let's just hope he's fine. That team will be good. Uh next up on your list, this is a fun one because we have an EFIS debut between you and I here on Flippin' Bats. Let's talk about Garrett Stubbs' EFIS fastball combo. This may have been the meanest at bat all year. He gives that little EFIS and then zips a fastball by him next pitch. I mean, and that overlay is fantastic. You have Real Muto just taking off before this pitch actually lands. Look at that. In the overlay, he's pumping his fist gone. That's how much velo difference there is between these pitches. I watched the I watched this overlay you you posted on Twitter. Uh, it was either last night or the night before, and I was just dying of laughter because it's so the EFIS was so slow that in the overlay you can the catcher gets up and is pumping his fist while the EFIS is still in the air in the overlay. It just makes it it's just beautiful and it's actually very difficult to hit. 
I have never seen I have never seen that before in an overlay. I mean, maybe because there's not not been a, like a 47 mile an hour difference between pitches in one of my overlays. Um, but yeah, all right. So as a hitter, what do you do here? Like you're sitting there going, all right, this guy's you know lobbing Ephesus is in there, and then all of a sudden you get an 84 mile an hour fastball that seems like it's 104. Uh, this next guy on your list, I'm excited to talk about because it just means he's back and healthy for now, and he's got pitches going all over the place. Let's talk about Dustin May. So so for my money, Dustin May is perhaps the filthiest pitcher in baseball, just stuff-wise. He needs to refine his command coming back from injury. But you have this 99-mile-an-hour two-seamer. I think this ran 20 inches, um, just absolutely brutal. And he also combines that with a breaking ball. I think he calls it a curveball. Um, that this had 3,390 RPMs. I mean, that's nuts. And then that you overlay. Wild. Yeah, I mean, it's it's he's got he's got one of the filthiest curveballs in the major leagues. You combine that now here with a sinker and that breaking ball. They look right down the middle. And then they go onto different continents from there. Like, look at that. It makes me feel better about sitting here right now because, you know, I know that I faced a lot of these guys and then I see them on your overlays and it's like, okay, maybe I shouldn't feel bad about hitting 230 against these guys. Like this is, this is, um, this is, this should be impossible to hit theoretically. <laughs> I, I think it should like, to me, every hit, in the major leagues, especially off a guy like this, it's like a minor miracle. I don't know how you do this other than guess, luckily. And even if you guess right, it's not like these pitches are just like laid in there. These, Even if you knew it was coming, it's going to be tough. Um, next up on your list for this week, one of the nastiest and probably one of the more underrated pitchers in the game of baseball, Tristan McKenzie, absolute stud and his curveball. That's that's exactly why I put him in here. He does not get the love he deserves other than from Guardians fans. But his curveball is totally filthy. It's it's filthy and gorgeous at the same time. It's a pure 12-6. Looks so pretty, um, but it's devastating. And he had, what, 13 Ks last night? That was uh, just a tour de force of pitching. Like, I love watching a dude pitch. He pitches with emotion. He's so much fun. And this helps set up his elevated fastball as well. So this it's such a great pitch. It was it's fitting that he 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 put the exclamation mark on the AL Central, I think. It's not technically over, but his outing last night, he went out there and said, I'm finishing this off. This division is ours. And against a good team that had been playing better of late, uh, just made them look absolutely silly. <laughs> Yeah, and I got some pushback because I had him like number five on my list of top five pitchers, um, 25 and under. And everybody's like, well, why is Tristan? I'm like, because Tristan McKenzie is a is a stud. And I don't know that everybody has been watching him as closely as maybe you and I do. But hopefully his 14K game and his 13K game open some eyes among some people. Yeah, I agree. A guy that's uh, opening a lot of eyes these days, including yours and including mine, uh, Shohei Otani. He is once again here. Uh, well, you know, we get some we get some bonus picks in here. So uh, Shohei is on here. Tell me why. Because I always like to over deliver, Ben. That's what I do. I put in bonus picks because I love them. And this is a 99 mile an hour fastball and a splitter. And I love this because you can see how they swap places. You see that splitter start out above the fastball disappears on you and then you still have that 99 mile an hour fastball boring in again to how anybody hits anything this is a great example like that is pure filth pure filth is right <laughs> i just learned the uh i just learned the japanese word for nasty because i do a japanese word of the day on this show every tuesday and the japanese word for nasty is igui and that certainly <laughs> was that. Name. And so was, it is, right? I love it. And uh, <laughs> gooey. certainly a gooey. Yes, a gooey. Certainly a gooey is 
Kevin Gosman's pitch that we're about to talk about. So uh, tell me, and this was great. I, I saw you posted about this as well. You kind of went in on Bryce Harper here. This was great. <laughs> tell me about it. I, I Number one, I love Bryce Harper. Like, I think he's he's obviously a fantastic hitter. I just loved him trying to sell that he fouled off this ball. He's pointing to his bat. Like, look, I hit it off here. And he's like, can I get some help here? I'm like, Bryce, I can give you help. Because on this side view, you missed this pitch by <laughs> six inches. I don't know what you were thinking, but you did not come close to touching that, Bryce. The slow-mo side by the slow-mo from the side is great because he argues, can I get some help? And then you watch the replay, and he's a good, I don't know, six inches away from the baseball, which is a lot. Um, but I must say, I have been there as well, and you're just trying to put some doubt in anybody's mind. Like, I fouled it off. That's why the catcher didn't catch it. And all you're trying to do is get just a little bit of doubt, um, but then it doesn't look good when the when the replay shows up. Well, like, I, I watched the replay because I had doubt. I was watching it in you know, real time, and I'm like, maybe he tipped it. He's arguing. He looks convincing. Yeah, he'd be a good actor. I mean, he had me bought for a little bit until I saw the replay. Um, so I, I've mentioned before some of my favorite stuff that you do, aside from, you know, the, these, your, your normal stuff is great and it's what makes you great. But some of my favorite stuff is the stuff that we never expect, like the basketball toss off of the backboard last year in the playoffs or whenever that was. And you got one for us this week, Tom Brady's tablet throw. Yeah, it's, it's a great 12-6 tablet it's a breaking tablet right you have a breaking ball this is a breaking tablet i put a t i put a little tail on it so you can see the break and that is filthy look at how much drop he has on that pretty good arm that's action, some good right? uh he's he's got some good rpms on that and uh the the old guy's still got it he's still he's still throwing some rockets and some banger of 12 6 curve balls <laughs> yeah i mean look that's beautiful i mean we had mckenzie now we have brady um, before I let you go, I won't put you on the spot in the baseball world because you just cover everybody. But in the football world, who's your favorite football team? You know, that is hard. I don't get to watch a lot. I grew up, and unfortunately, I'm going to say this, I grew up a Jets fan, which is not a fa- I mean, that's okay. that's a really tough team to, <laughs> to, to root for. I do follow college football a lot more um, because I'm a Tar Heel. So go Heels. We got a big game this week. I mean, let's go. Okay. All right. Love it. So, uh, as always, every week, Pitching Ninja joins me. Make sure you are all following him at Pitching Ninja on Twitter. He is one of the best baseball follows. So, uh, if you like pitching and you like baseball, follow him. And I don't know who doesn't like those things. So, Rob, thank you so much for joining me, as always, my friend. Thank you, Ben. Great as usual. All right, now thanks again to Rob for joining me. What a blast of an episode. Two great guests, one of the best pitchers to ever do it, and one of the best baseball Twitter follows. If you're not following Rob on Twitter, check it out, at Pitching Ninja there. And again, just for me to be able to have John Smoltz on this show every week lately is something that I will uh, forever be appreciative of. He was one of my favorite players growing up, and to bring him to you all every single week now has been so much fun i hope you all enjoyed this episode this double whammy episode with smoltz and pitching ninja until next time make sure you all subscribe follow anywhere you listen to your podcast apple spotify wherever also follow along on all social media twitter instagram facebook tiktok and you can watch every single episode as well at flipping bats pod for all of them This one has been a blast. I hope you all have a great weekend. Until next time, this has been another episode of Flippin' Bats. Peace.